I was uh, literally on the 405 or on 405 when traffic came to a screeching halt, which is very common out there. Um, but then I'm hearing everything on the scanners and all the stuff. So put it in park and I pull out my phone. I start watching the live feeds and exactly what happens or supposed to happen, happen. Cops come in, they establish a perimeter, fire, medical personnel. Everybody's holding on that perimeter until they render part of that environment safe. So a building a floor within that building, whatever it is, so that they can move medical personnel in to help deal with triage that needs to happen. But also they started pushing kids, you know, college kids out of these buildings once they would clear it. And um, 99.9% of them had a backpack on. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, like, that. oh my God, I think if I could take that and literally separate it, it would have the same level of armor hidden inside of it that I wear standing next to the President of the United States. going on everyone welcome back to american snippets thank you so much for tuning in today this is episode number 183 our guest today built a life of international travel and global intrigue as an entrepreneur and a secret service agent he first followed his entrepreneurial spirit into business that introduced him to the world of travel uh, and then he actually revisited his, his desire to join the secret service where he dedicated himself uh, for 12 years as a secret service agent. Today, he's moved back into that entrepreneurial path with his company's Leatherback Gear and Hero Beverage. And Leatherback Gear actually arose from Mike's personal connection to people who have survived shootings and his professional knowledge of such situations. So what he did is he designed backpacks fitted with armor plates to offer students protection in the event that they were caught in a shooting situation. He then expanded that entrepreneurial work to something called Hero Beverage. Hero stands for Help Everyone Remain Operational. And the company crafts uh, specialty coffees geared to help people raise money and support their local communities. In this episode of American Snippets, Mike DeGus shares his story of leaving his small town life to live globally. He talks about the ins and outs of working in the Secret Service, and he explains how the work he is doing uh, now can impact the lives of struggling or vulnerable Americans. So without further ado, here is Barbara Allen with Mike DeGus. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of American Snippets. I'm your co-host, Barb Allen. Mike DeGuest, let's get into it with you today. This is going to be fun, and I'm so happy that you took the time to sit down with us. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit. We're going to go right as we talked just a few minutes ago. We're going to take people through, Mike. You're, you have a history in the Secret Service, and now you're doing some incredible things in the entrepreneurial fact uh, that really give back to our communities and our country as a whole. It's really awesome what you're doing. But let's, of course, go into the Secret Service part of your life first. How did you, when when did you join that? So I, um, I signed on, my EOD date was back in November of uh, 2008. Um, and it's one of those interesting careers. It's, it's almost like a calling. So it's, it's part of your DNA. If you're a protection guy and, and in safety security, you want to help other people and look out, it's just down to your core. And I've known that since the seventh grade. Um, I have things in yearbooks. I have a, a guidance counselor from high school I took a test with that showed I was perfect acumen for, for security. But in the little town, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Um, Where was that? And I said, Ridgecrest, California. Okay. So little Navy town down in the desert, Mojave Desert. Um, great place to grow up, far from everything, but it was also far from everything. <laughs> um, and so when, when they had a kid come in and say, Hey, I want to, I want to be in the secret service. Um, they, they didn't know what to do with, with me. And so at the time I actually took the initiative, um, w which is sort of rare for what they were experiencing at the time, but we had the yellow pages, which nobody even knows what that is today. But I pulled out the yellow pages and there was, um, honest to God, there was a secret service listing not far from Ridgecrest in Bakersfield, California, uh, for the secret service. So I picked up the phone called and some some lady answered she passed me over to an agent and this guy spent close to an hour talking to some kid he'd never meet making all the difference in his life to tell him it's a bit the greatest job you'll ever have in your life and he took the time to send me an application brochures pamphlets and everything else so 
from there forward, that's just kind of been my educational trajectory of what I wanted to do. And then once I finally got on, um, based on a bunch of other things I did, entrepreneurial, traveling around the world, being a gypsy before going to the service, um, that, that's been a big thing for me is always whenever I'm out there passing out the lapel pins, shaking hands because people are, I mean, nobody, nobody gets to touch that world. And um, so I've always tried to make a difference. In fact, I actually had a group of kids at the LA office, uh, Cub Scouts, um, came through with, with some dads that I knew, gave them a tour. And I just heard um, a couple of weeks ago, one of those kids is now in the process to be hired with the, with the service. So pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So you didn't go directly into the secret service. You said you did, what did, what did you do in between, you know, in that gap period before that first phone call? I mean, between yeah, that first so phone call and that. I'm, um, I'm kind of an anomaly for the secret service, I guess I would say. Um, you know, I mentioned ago a minute where it's, it's part of your DNA and down to your core, if that's who you are, I happen to have two strands running through. So one is a, I'm a, I'm a marketeer inventor kind of tinkerer guy an entrepreneur at heart. Um, as well as the, I, I just, I got to help people. And so I'm a big problem solver. And so when I got out of college, I went to Cal state Fullerton and did my bachelor's degree in criminal justice there and immediately went over to Fiji. My dad retired. Um, so I went and played farmer John out in the rainforest for three months, helping him build a house um, out there. And while I was there, I fell into importing stuff out of Fiji into the States, created a whole brand and, and world that I ran for a couple, uh, about two and a half, three years. And I got out of that because it just wasn't, wasn't uh, challenging anymore, I guess is the word I would use. So I exited that, played around with a bunch of little things in between, um, moved overseas to Prague. I lived in, in the Czech Republic for a little while, taught English abroad over there, traveled around Eastern Europe, uh, worked on a master's degree, got a master's degree in international relations, um, came back, started a PhD in public policy, and got hired with the Secret Service. Uh, I pretty much was laser focused on getting into that uh, post 9-11 world. I think um, everybody had an itch to want to help. And um, that, that was my drive. That was just where I was going. And so I kind of shelved my entrepreneurial world of what I was trying to do to go do some public service. Um, and so I spent, I got hired on and, and had the, the career of a lifetime in 12 years. And in the course of doing that, was building some stuff on the side. And it was just one of those experiences where I had to hang it up because it just got, I got too busy with too many other things and I could do far more help outside than I could inside. Um, but I, man, I had a blast. I did eight years in the LA field office. Uh, I did all the cyber investigations. I was out grabbing gangsters on the street. We did undercover ops. We did uh, protection details. We traveled all over the world uh, with you, you name somebody you could think of that the service protects and I've been around them. So multiple presidents. Uh, vice presidents, foreign dignitaries, United Nations conference security programs every year that we do um, in and out of LA with all the stuff that we would do. And um, just just had an absolute blast. And then from there, I got transferred to DC and was assigned. I was fortunate enough to get assigned to the presidential protection world because there's, there's kind of a few worlds you can get. And the one that everybody knows, the one that they make the movies about is the presidential details. So I was fortunate enough to get called into that. Um, and got into a ton of stuff uh, on the shift, got to fly on Air Force One um, at the White House every day. Uh, and, you know, I'm a kid from the desert town that when I left to go to Cal State Fullerton, there was more students enrolled at Cal State Fullerton than there was population in my hometown. Wow. So it, it, it's really, a um, you know, you could stop there at the White House and go, man, you, you did it. But it, um, it was kind of a, the beginning for, for yeah. where I'm going now. Yeah, that's um, great. What what is uh, what are some of the things they look forward to get into the Secret Service? You know, I'm thinking like I have a son now in college. He's going for criminal justice, uh, forensics. He's determined to be FBI, you know, ballistics guy. Uh, but no, if he were no, interested, yeah, <laughs> I, totally kidding, totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> get it? Um, but you That's know, who knows? <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Um, so, but if he were interested in secret service, you know, if you have a college age student who's looking to go directly into that, what are some things that they can do to prepare themselves to be um, competitive in the application process for the secret service? Boy, that's a great question. Um, because the, the, uh, let me, let me back into the answer for yeah. you, starting with some, some other stuff. The, the world of service, no two agents have the same career. No two days are ever the same. So I've been through boring days and I've been through, if you ever saw um, uh, the series 24 with Kiefer Sutherland, uh, where he was doing his thing in 24 hours in a day, he right. was working. Right. And go, 
I've had multiple days where I'd start and I thought I was done. And, you know, the next morning at four o'clock, I'm still going. And um, there, there's guys that I ran with, guys and gals I ran with on the job. But all of us had very different veins that we would get into. And um, so because of that, the service doesn't have a rubber stamp like, hey, I need you to be focused on one thing and go that way and come to us. But it really, it, it's, kind of, um, it's kind of analogous, Barbara, to, to being an entrepreneur. Uh, honest to God, um, you have to be a self-starter. It has to be in your DNA to say, hey, I want to stand there and help. And, and in the world of service, it's unlike any other investigative world where you can go do investigations with just about any badge and gun carrying department or agency you can get into. But with the service, you, you actually will put your life on the line um, for, for people that, that maybe you like, you don't like. And that's really not relevant. They may like you. They may not like you. It's really not relevant. And I, I don't know what it is that takes somebody to be called into that world and say, hey, I'll, I'll put on the samurai sword and I'll go to work. Um, but, but it's really something that if it's not part of you wanting to step up and be a self-starter to, to go out and hunt down casework and find people that are, that are causing issues and solve those problems, um, it, it's just not in you. So no degree program in the world is going to go and give you all that and just install it in you and say, hey, you, you got a degree in forensics or you got a degree in chemistry or you got a degree none of that applies. What applies to me and in my, my view of it was, and, and by the way, I did interviewing and help get people on, but okay. the ones that it, it was like a sense almost when I would meet people, I could tell you in a handshake, that, that's one right there. And then I could tell you right away, no way would I put my life on the line with you behind me because you get in the stack, you go in the doors, you're, you're hunting down people where I've tackled them, where they've got guns hanging on the wall, ready to pull the trigger at us. But I got to rely on you and you. And when I ran in L.A. in the streets and what we were doing, there was a handful of guys that um, I mean, some of them are on the wall here behind me that um, I would trust them with my life today. And we, we just became a it, I wouldn't call us, you know, the, the SEAL teams or any of that kind of stuff. Right. But you get to where you know somebody and how they operate and work and that no matter what, we're going home today because I know they're going to do everything I would do to make sure that they're going home. And so it's really, there's no book that's going to give you it. There's no education that's going to give it to you. It's, it's literally a self-starting driving thing, which is why I say it's very analogous to if you know entrepreneurship and you, you're an entrepreneur in your DNA, you, you're a secret service agent through and through. And yeah. you'd be bored to tears in any other department because you're, you're stuck in one world. So local, state, federal, county, you don't get to go outside of those bubbles. I got to travel the world. I got to affect casework all over the world. I did um, gangsters in the street with credit card and identity theft stuff and then moved into the cyber world. And I started, if you remember things like the Target Data Breach, Home Depot, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. I was, I was on point for a lot of those and working with guys that I knew in foreign offices around the world. And we were, we were doing all kinds of stuff to, to get these people arrested and prosecuted. And then plus that you do protection. So you get to go jump in car planes and go spend uh, a week in Petra, Jordan which if you ever saw like Indiana Jones and the last crusade where they have all that stuff carved in, I've got some unbelievable photos and experiences where you go over there and president Obama's driving the, the camp David, um, uh, black suburbans through Petra. And I'm standing there with a Royal Jordanian guard. Like I'm a kid from the desert. What in the world? How do you get there? <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah. a, it's an unbelievable oh. career. You know, I don't think a lot of people, myself included were, even aware that the secret service did anything outside of protection. Um, you know, yeah. so the invest, the investigation aspect of it, uh, you know, it just is never out there, you know, you yeah, always so think of the other Let me unpack that a little for you. Cause yeah. I get that a lot from people uh, where they, they just assume you're the European shade suit and tie. Um, and the best way I can describe it to you would be if, if you um, looked at the financial system of the U S government, like it's a person that the service protects, we protect the financial system the way we protect a person, place, or thing. And so an agent's right. career can be like 70, 30 on investigations and 30% protection. Sometimes it goes 50, 50, it could be 60, 40, but in that world, you, you have to do three phases of a career. Phase one is field office time. And so you're, you're kind of cutting your teeth right out of the academy on investigations. So you get to an office you're assigned, you could already have cases assigned to you 
before you even walk in the door the first day, which I did. Uh, I had four or five of them assigned to me, and you just start running. And depending on who um, impacts you at that office, who gets to work with you, can really make or break a career for an agent because you start learning the game. You learn how, how to go out and work informants and really get into the groove. And then the other piece of it is phase two, you move from, from all that investigative work where you dabble in protection. So you have what we call post stand, you do local uh, assignments. So you could be responsible for a hotel in LA when the president comes in with somebody from the president's detail. So you're, you're constantly learning and sharpening your sword. And then you go to, to phase two where it's all protection. And that could be a former president's detail. That could be the vice president's detail. That could be presidential detail. There, there's a variety of things. And then phase three is when you wrap up phase two, you go back out. Now you can go back into the field, do investigations. You can kind of get promoted up. You can stay out and do more protection if you want. Um, but most people don't know that the Secret Service, um, it, its sole function originally in 1865, actually, it was signed into law in existence. The morning President Lincoln was assassinated. He signed us into existence to suppress counterfeiting. And we, don't, we didn't start picking up protection until 1901 when, McKinley, when uh, President McKinley was assassinated. So almost a like 36 year window where all we did was investigations and no, nobody even knows that. But yeah. today, all you know us for is the, the, the big parades and, you know, the, the earpiece shades and security. Yeah. Thank you, Hollywood. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Okay. So you have 12 years in the, in the field of secret service. Can you talk about one particular day on the job or one, detail assignment you were given something that you can talk about that um you know has an interesting message or story or just stuck with you boy there's so many cases that we did yeah. um uh man um you know we we did a couple of good ones with some armenian power gangs um i did some stuff with some asian gangs in la but one in particular, there was a, a rising lieutenant in the Armenian power gang that, um, you know, it's probably not smart for me to even get into this, but whatever. Um, <laughs> they, they, um, they were ruthless, ruthless. And so anybody in my world, family and whatnot, I had to kind of give a heads up um, that I was going after them because of what was going on. I won't get into that piece. But suffice it to say, one of them made a mistake one night and I got a call at two o'clock in the morning. And he and I ended up playing chess. And he was kind of like, if you ever saw the movie, The Untouchables with, you know, De Niro oh, and, and the Cost. best movies. Yeah. So phenomenal. Um, yeah. This guy was like a, a rising Al Capone, so to speak. Uh -huh. And um, he was pretty much adamant that I had nothing on him and what we could do. We ended up getting him expelled, kicked out of, out of the country um, on very, very little. But we had a phenomenal relationship with the United States Attorney's Office with a variety of attorneys that I would work prosecutions with, which is something else on, on casework and secret service we can get into. It's all relationship building, just like entrepreneurship. Um, Cause without those, you couldn't get stuff done, but um, we got him kicked out and um, I ended up in court with this guy and we went in with the attorney and I, and they actually called in a tactical unit to escort the attorney out because right behind us was like, in the court scene with the untouchables was about a dozen who's who in the Armenian power world. I mean, there was a guy that looked like somebody taking a knife to his face, steroided out the whole bit. And it, um, it, it was a wild day. Wild day. I bet. What is it like, um, for somebody to have that job and be a family man, have a wife and kids? I mean, what are, <laughs> I, I know what it's like in the military, right? And and I've talked to law enforcement officers. I have not talked to somebody from the Secret Service uh, in terms of, and it's always interesting because it absolutely has to impact everything we do impacts our family. So how yeah, does so this my, impact? My family, all they ever knew, my, my three kids, all they ever knew was Secret Service lifestyle. And so um, I missed baseball. I missed ballet. I missed birthdays. I missed holidays. Uh, I missed important school meetings. Because you, you just didn't know if you were on rotation for travel and protection. Uh, sometimes you got 10, 12 hours notice. Sometimes you get a week. But usually um, I, I was on the road a lot, especially during the campaigns, which I had a lot of fun during campaigns. I got picked up. I was fortunate enough to know some of the right guys and got selected to be um, at the time. It was uh, Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney's uh, world when they were campaigning. And I got pulled on to uh, Paul Ryan's detail. And that was my first real experience in the world of being like um, 
true secret service agent with earpiece and shades. I mean, we, we bopped all over the country all the time for about four months. In fact, one particular day, I was in seven states in one day, taking him like in an airplane down. We get in the cars, go to a meeting, go to a rally, um, seven states in one day. And you get to a point where, um, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you some of the cities I was in the night we would land and go find the hotel and you just collapse. And then, you know, you, you, you have to learn the tricks of the travel now. Like you got to leave the light on somewhere because you, you, the rooms are all different. So you don't even know where mm-hmm. you are. But uh, family-wise, I ended up sending my my kids postcards. Uh, just something I started doing a uh, couple years on the job from all over the world, no matter I was in the U.S. or abroad. And so they've got you know a stack of postcards for each of them that's dated. And hey, here's where I'm at. You know, bring here sometime. So they they have a cool thing where you know you try to get them to touch the world. Um, when I was in L.A., they got to get up close to the motorcade. So, you know, it was nothing for like my son to be around, you know, 30 motorbikes with the CHP, all the presidential cars or the, the limos and all that stuff. Get to, It was just like normal, you know, and o- Obama's landing in HMX uh, Marine One at the time out there. And it, it was just normal for them to be up close and see that. And so today, um, you know, I've got some stuff here. I've got a ton of other stuff that we've got uh, Christmas cards from the White House and the president, first lady, all all these neat photos and stuff all over the house. Um, but it's, it's just, it's like anybody else's job to them. Um, you know, yeah. well, yeah, my dad was secret service, big deal, you know, <laughs> but they're standing there with a photo with the president of the United States. So for me growing right. up in a little desert town, that was unthinkable when I was a kid for them, yeah. it, it, you know, the, the hard part is being gone. The, the, the trade off for me is what will that make your imagination do for you in life? Where, where are you going to get to? Because if your starting line is that, mine was like in the sewer somewhere and compared to that. Um, yeah. So if that's your starting point, and I, I drive it home constantly on, it's it's a self-starting world. I mean, take the ideas, take the entrepreneurship. I mean, if you guys want to do what I do today, I, it's the honor of a lifetime to be a part of the Secret Service. And I do it again in a heartbeat. That was the hardest, hardest, hardest decision. Uh, yeah. And I have no qualms telling you about it. I mean, I shed tears when I left. Um, to, to take the badge off in headquarters and slide it over the counter and all my gun and everything I had to give back uh, was absolutely brutal because you don't get to be a part of a world that you spent your whole life trying to get to. But now for them, uh, I get to be home. I get to see, you know, take them to baseball, karate, uh, help with homework, do all, do all the stuff now. Um, yeah. So how, you know, old are, I, how old are your kids now? So I've got a six-year-old daughter, nine-year-old son, and a 12, almost 13-year-old daughter going on 30. So, Yes, that's how it goes. I have a bunch of boys myself, all older, but I have two stepkids. One of them's 15-year-old stepdaughter, and it's an education. <laughs> <laughs> smile and nod, smile and nod. <laughs> I love her. I love her. It's Absolutely. Education. Yeah. <laughs> My it's, parents it's, were blessed that I was such a loser, let me tell you that. That's because funny. Because she is not... Uh, yeah, so that's cool stuff. You know, on another day, I'll tell you how I was politely escorted out of the White House um, by the Secret <laughs> Service um, during a presidential visit for Gold Stars. Um, that's another story. But uh, yeah, we can talk about I, that offline. I was not a bad girl, I promise you. Uh, they just didn't like me. So, <laughs> you know, that's how it is. So you talk about how hard it was to leave something that you love so deeply. I think a lot of people listening are going to be able to connect to that, whether for whatever reason, right? We all get to a point where we're at the stage, we have to make a decision, either something we really love or hanging on to is going to hold us back from what we could do next, or maybe it's not so good for us. But there's always that point in our lives, whether it's a relationship, a job, a home, a location, a habit, what something we have to give up in order to move into another part of life, which in the, that decision is always, it it can be pretty agonizing. So what was it for you that was so driving that allowed you to have that, you know, that grit to make that difficult decision and follow through with it? Yeah, that's a tough question, Barbara. Um, so I'm one of five boys, uh, all five of us are public servants. Um, Oh, God bless one. your parents. Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a whole other story offline, too. But um, yeah, yeah the, it, I, no matter the the pitfalls as a parent, yeah, the job got done somehow or another. And yeah. all five of us are public servants, military, law enforcement. 
uh, in medical space now. He's he's one one's a Navy, but doctor in the Navy, getting ready to exit out in the private sector. But in any event, awesome. I'm the only one that was born overseas. My dad was in the army briefly uh, for four years, I believe, and was in Turkey instead. Of, he got assigned to Turkey instead of Vietnam. And along came Mike. And I don't know if it's because I was born abroad. I, I have no idea what it yeah. is that that drives somebody to want to do the change. But one of the lessons I've learned being in the service and all the stuff that I've done bouncing around the world, um, the magic happens in the movement. And being stagnant and staying in something because it's kind of comfortable or that's what's expected, um, that's where the routine starts to happen. And it's uh, it's boring for a guy like me, which is why being if, if the only career and job I've really ever had was being a Secret Service agent as a career. I mean, I've worked, I've done a ton of stuff. I was a handyman. I worked my way through college. I, I mean, you know, everything all on my own. But the real career I have is a service. And if there was ever one designed for a guy who's got the DNA and, and core of an entrepreneur and wanting to help, it's a secret service agent um, because you're moving all the time. The cases can evolve and change all the time. And I'm never stuck on one thing every day. And I think the, the, the way to sum it up for you is that the, the magic is, is in the movement. And so making the decision, um, as hard as that was, was that 12 years on, um, I could do a 20 year career with the service and retire. So I had eight years to go because I, I was a late starter into the service. Mm -hmm. I got on at 32 years old. Um, I'm about to turn 45 now. Um, I could have stayed till 52 and retired and had a pension and all that kind of fun stuff. Or you look at it, the other lens of that's eight years and I'm about to come off of the president's detail, which means I'm going out to pasture and be what I used to jokingly refer to, you know, the hair bags guys that, <laughs> You, you go back out and, and look for a spot you want to retire to and then try to find a job post-career with the service to go work security somewhere. Right. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't get there. Um, I loved every second of it, but I also knew what that path looked like. And so I'm, I'm the guy that says, let's go take the, the knife out and a machete and let's go carve one. And so I've been building things forever, as far back as I can remember. And so with Leatherback and Hero and all the stuff that I've been doing, it got to a point where it was percolating and bubbling and taking so much time and attention outside of service, outside of family responsibility, everything right. going on that um, you have to make the decision. And, and again, the magic, the magic's in the movement. I, I don't yeah, care. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's one of our new favorite quotes now. We'll attribute it to you. <laughs> don't worry. Please. Uh, so talk about, you were sharing with me prior to this story about- By the way, I just made that up. Well, genius. Gene, that's always where you get the best stuff, right? Where that's you're it. in the moment and you do it. Yeah. So you were telling me prior to this about when you were on a on the job one day and you got stuck in traffic and you heard a report of a shooting. Oh my God, yeah. And what that led you to. Let's uh, take people through that and get into what you're doing now. Yeah. So there's a, a really cool story about that that I I regrettably shouldn't share with your audience, but I'd be glad to tell you afterwards about how okay. this whole day unfolded. But at the time, I was doing the lead for at the who was at the time candidate Donald Trump coming to L.A. Right. Orange County, and so it was my job to effectively control uh, security and safety around everywhere he went. And if you remember anything during the 2016 campaigns, he was a lightning rod. Whether you love the guy or you hate right. him, it did, none of it mattered. He was a lightning rod. And so He's again, the only my guy job to be a bigger one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I <laughs> I stayed out of politics. Yeah. I stay out of it with my brands and uh, right. my business stuff. But we had a job to do, period. And so I, it was the honor of a lifetime, again, to get to be responsible for all of L.A. and Orange County for a presidential candidate coming in. And um, so backing up a hair from that, my older brother, current law enforcement, um, he's got, I think, two years to go till he's going to retire. But about 13, 14 years ago in our little hometown of Ridgecrest, um, a guy went into a medical clinic connected to the hospital one day. And... Um, uh, my understanding was he was denied care because he didn't have identification, insurance, all the other stuff. And they sent him home to go get the stuff because it was a non-life-threatening issue. It was just whatever. So from what I what I know, he went home, wrote a letter to his wife, basically like a goodbye letter, um, grabbed a shotgun and a box of shells, put them in his pockets and went back to the medical clinic. And he walked in and butt checked the gal behind the counter with the end of the shotgun and started popping off shells. So my brother happened to be... Um, prior Coast Guard, did a lot of drug interdictions and stuff like that with boardings. And um, 
it really wasn't the in vogue thing. And I hate to use the word in vogue for active shooting, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't as common normal. at the time. Yeah. Common's a great word. Um, so in any event, he's a couple, couple blocks away. The call comes out. He's on his way to like traffic court. Um, so he spun around and went in and ended up going through clearing down the hallways and stuff, finds a guy at the end of the hallway uh, in a room with a gal uh, in there and he's reloading the shotgun. And so my brother gave him three commands to drop it. And on the third one, the guy racked the shotgun to raise it at him. So he shot and um, put two in his chest and, and killed the guy. Didn't set out that way. Didn't intend to, to start his day as a law enforcement officer. Didn't intend to start his career as a law enforcement guy um, taking somebody out. What he intended to do was help protect people. And um, so it was, that was my first foray into the world of active shooters and, and what it happens and how it affects a community, how it affects people, a business, and more importantly, how it affects the, the officer that pulled the trigger. Um, if he was here today, I, you know, he and I both be teary. I'd tell you the story. I mean, I, I hate to say that because he's a big, tough, macho dude, but in 15 seconds, he'd be teary. I'd tell you about the struggle and mm -hmm. how they had to take his gun. They put him on admin leave. They go through a whole investigation. Like he did something wrong. And um, so imagine going through your head where half of a community, you're a hero and half of your community, community you're a killer. Like, what do you do? Right. So um, we worked through a lot of that conversation. And then with me in the service, as you can imagine, doing all the, the protection, safety, security, I uh, did tons of trainings. We did active shooter events as it got to be more commonplace. We went through schools and did training environments. And, and so you kind of learn what goes on when these things unfold and what the, what the protocol calls are for each law enforcement, fire, EMT, all, all that kind of stuff rolled into one to create a plan. And um, it, it really bugged me and my brother that uh, there wasn't an answer for you if you're ever caught in one of these things, because arguably this is one of the worst situations a human being can be found. So while I was doing all my stuff in LA, I met everybody from um, like, I don't know if you see it on here, but Captain America, I was in this photo back here, um, the, the brothers that directed Captain America, the Winter Soldier, I was in that movie, met them, met, met a bunch of high level guys, CEOs, tech stuff. And um, uh, one of the guys I met is a, is a tech entrepreneur. Um, he called me and we started ideating through an app for active shooter stuff. And the problem I kept coming to him was like, hey, cool stuff, but this is great, this is great, this doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. But unless I tap this and the Iron Man suit jumps out, I, this it is a flashy anything. way right. to dial 911. Like, I, right. it just, it's not going to do it. So, knowing all of that stuff back into the world of 2016 in the summer um, when candidate Trump was coming, um, I'm about two miles away. I was just in protection mode, building out the plan, coming back from his golf course up to his residence in Beverly Hills when the UCLA school shooting broke out. And I was uh, literally on the 405 or on 405 when traffic came to a screeching halt which is very common out there. Um, but then I'm hearing everything on the scanners and all the stuff. So put it in park and I pull out my phone. I start watching the live feeds and exactly what happens or is supposed to happen, happen. Cops come in, they establish a perimeter, fire, medical personnel. Everybody's holding on that perimeter until they render part of that environment safe. So a building a floor within that building, whatever it is, so that they can move medical personnel in to help deal with triage that needs to happen. But also they started pushing kids, you know, college kids out of these buildings once they would clear it. And 99.9% um, .9 of them had a backpack on. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, like, that. oh my God, I think if I could take that and literally separate it, it would have the same level of armor hidden inside of it that I wear standing next to the President of the United States. It's extremely lightweight. Um, you wouldn't, you, most people don't even know it's in a backpack when we did it. So I had, I went to work with drawings that night. Um, I crafted the ugliest backpack you've ever seen in your life, but got the, the concept to, to do what I needed to do and then started to, to work forward from there because, again, the magic's in the movement. Like mm -hmm. once I had it, um, I, I knew that that was the solution in the interim, but then would anybody adopt what it, what it was? And so what, what's kind of become, Barbara, is if I um, when I started it, it was like I was crazy. It, nobody in their right mind is going to buy this thing. You might sell a hundred of these, but you're insane. And the next thing you know, we're, um, we're, we're starting to scale big time. Uh, I've got 
shareholders. I've got a market that we built from scratch. We combine two markets, apparel and safety or security into something that nobody's ever seen. I've got collaborations coming with, with FUBU and Damon John, uh, Taya Kyle, um, stores like Costco carry what I sell now. And what I spent a lot of time doing was trying to educate people of this is no different. I understand guns are scary. I understand the political debates. That's not my problem. That's not my job. While there's right. a lot of smart people on the Hill, 45 minutes to an hour from me that are going to work through whatever that needs to be, people are dying. So in the meantime, how do we help them? And it's no different than um, if I said to you, have you ever been in a fire? Right. Yeah, no. No. Do, do you know the last time uh, a child died in a fire at a school? Do you know when that was? Nope. Would you be shocked if I told you that was close to 70 years ago? Yeah, no, I would have literally no idea. So take your word for it. Yeah. But but yet now, if if the room you're in catches on fire, let's say there's a fire in the building or whatever, like do you, do you know what you would even do? Yeah, you got you always got to have a plan, right? Depends on the room you're in. Depend. I remember one time right after my husband was murdered, and I was all like still paranoid and scared, and always like hyper vigilant. Like I just could not relax. First time I took my four little boys to a movie theater to see whatever movie it was trying to be normal, right? I was just this ball of nerves. And yeah. it was a kid's movie. My kids were little. And we walked into the movie theater. I got them seated down, seated down. And I noticed that a group of tall, like young adult guys entered the movie theater oh, with boy. no kids. And I was like, hmm. what is up? And shootings had occurred at that point already. Yeah. And I was like, what, what are these guys doing in the theater, right? And I watched as they dispersed to all four corners of the movie theater and just stood there. They definitely did not belong. And now here I am. Now I'm feeling trapped in the movie theater. And my husband had been murdered. So that was not a foreign concept mm. to me. Um, and so now I'm feeling like I've just walked my kids into this death box like this but you know i'm so i have and everybody around me is eating their popcorn and laughing and i have these bells going off in my head like how am i going to protect my kids if if, if shit is going to go sideways here do i dive on them do i get them so i very like calmly got my kids up mommy needs to go to the bathroom let's come outside with me you know and i walked them out i'm looking at these guys didn't belong i got security and something happened and they were escorted out right but so that's the closest i can come to ever feeling like i i was in a situation with my children where I would not be able to protect them, uh, you know, if something had gone awry. But and that's nothing well, near someone who's in an actual situation where something goes on. But it's a, it's still, it's not a good feeling. So, like yeah. a product like yours would have been like I would have been like strap those things on, kids. You know, like well, and that's the beauty. Let's like, get out. Hiding, yeah. hiding the skill sets and ability of Secret Service agents yeah. within a, a product that everybody has multiple backpacks. Right. If not just one diaper bags for your kids, you got them. Like, yeah, that's right. And they go everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So. so your product, then you have armor plates that you put in backpacks. Yeah. We, we say they go in and suit up on their, uh, on their protection vest. It's the same level cops wear out in their, in their cars, driving around every day, putting their life on the line to help their communities. It's the same level that I wore and you'd never even noticed it under our dress shirts and stuff under suits standing next to the president of the United States. Yeah. I, so that's what I put you, in. You sell, and do you sell backpacks that come with the place? Yeah. Yeah. So, our, so you our can get either the whole package it. or you could just yeah. get the armor plates that you put in your own backpack. Yeah. yeah. I, I initially started with just the system sold with the two panels inside and I didn't sell it any other way. And then we started to find that there was law enforcement guys and gals that are like, Hey, I already have armor. Can I just buy the backpack? Uh, and then places like Amazon won't let you sell armor, which is a whole nother conversation, but you can't sell <laughs> armor on their website, which I found amusing. You could sell gun holsters, but not a gun, but I can't, I can't put armor in any way, shape or form anyway. So we, we sell it as a backpack with nothing. You could buy it with one panel or two panels, um, and complete the system, which is the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Very cool. Are you finding, um, you know, the price point's a little high, obviously, I'm sure it's not a cheap product to make. Are you finding that there's pushback from parents on, on the price point? Or are you just finding that there's enough demand for it that that's not an issue? So initially, there was pushback. Um, yeah. But once we got into the world of it, and I've had some copycatters, I've had some knockoff stuff. I have people that um, have started putting panels in just backpacks, 
Um, and our, our range is 250 to 400 bucks with two armor panels. I got to tell you, buying a vest cost me five, 600 bucks. Yeah, I'm sure. Right. It's not cheap stuff. Yeah. So we don't, we don't break down line item by line item, how much it costs fulfillment, you know, all the stuff that I do, but the mission for us was to help people. It wasn't to rape and pillage and make millions of dollars. That that's not nope, the concept. I get here. it. Yeah. Right. So I, I could. It's hard for people to understand. Well, yeah. What I was at is, uh, I was wondering exactly if people were accusing you of that. Like, how? Why would you try to? When you mentioned the trolls, I was imagining like that's one thing. We, you know, we when you look at it as a parent, pure... you're like, "What's your kid's like? What life worth?" Right. And so yeah, you know, there's and the other the, side that's of the, the million dollar yeah. question right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Imagine for a moment. You, you're, and I'll tell you a story. Uh, you almost buy it and decide too expensive to spend 250 yeah. bucks, and then it happens. I, I, I don't, I don't ever want to be in that situation. But I no. had a guy. Okay. Um, oh, hold on. Where'd you go? Yep. Sorry. Yep. Um, I had a guy that um, he was in the Pensacola shooting. If you remember that one down at the mm-hmm. flight school not too long ago, um, and he called right after he got interviewed uh, after the shooting occurred in that classroom, he called us about an hour or two after, after, literally after the triggers were pulled and the bullets were flying, cops were there. He got interviewed and immediately called my customer service team. They call me and like, you have to talk to this guy. Like what's going on? Well, he's a Marine pilot was literally in the classroom and was just shot at I'm like, yeah, put him on. So I call my brother, Brad, who'd been in the, in the shooting. And the two of us talked to this guy and, and therapy is not the word I would give you, but um, just kind of worked him through what it, what it's like. I get it. I, I, it sucks to be shot at. Yeah. Totally understand. Um, but the story he went on to tell us and why he called us was about a week or two prior to the shooting, he had one of the, the $400 backpacks in the checkout cart on our site that I don't, you can plug whatever you want to plug, but on the site and decided right at the last minute, never going to happen to me. And he canceled it. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. He says, I, I am blown away that literally a week or two ago, I had it in the car. I would have had it in the classroom. Right. And I said, how close were you to the, he goes, I, I was two desks away. He pulled the guy, he missed me by about an inch. He said, and the guy, I mean, the guy's bawling, crying right. the whole bit. And then right. from, from there, I, you know, I'm, not not my business to share about who he is or what's going on. But no, no, no. Yeah. We, we've had about a half a dozen conversations with with Brad and I with this guy, just following up, checking in on him, trying to trying to help right, as right, you right. work through and process what you just saw. Um, yeah. And yeah. So I'm going to lead you now into that theme. You talk about trying to help because we're going to run out of time, and I don't want to do so without talking about the next aspect of what you do. So tell us about Hero Beverage. Yeah, so Hero, um, when the pandemic for COVID started, yeah. um, way back February-ish, March-ish, uh, around April, I was getting crushed, well, not I, but Leatherback Gear was getting crushed on social for donation requests. Hey, would you send and donate to frontline workers, first responders, fi- of course, happy to help. Blah, blah. But then it, it triggers you, like, wh- the world of uh, the, the stuff that they needed was all the, the, the gloves, the masks. The, the personal protection stuff that they needed for all that to deal with COVID. And so, yeah, I can give you backpacks and I understand the riots and all the stuff happening. So happy to help, but are we really helping and affect something here? And so one morning I got up early um, at like four o'clock uh, head running a hundred miles an hour on the hero concept, because I kept seeing the word used around medical personnel, cops, firefighters as heroes. And um, it, again, hit me that uh, heroes need to be patted on the back here because they're out there helping everyone remain operational. And so we, uh, we built a, an apparel line on leatherback around hero, which is actually what I'm wearing now, but it was, um, it was purely going to be selling shirts and then donating the proceeds to the cops, firefighters, and, and medical personnel to, to buy uh, sanitizers, masks, mm-hmm. N95 masks, gloves, all that kind of stuff that they would need. And I felt like that was a better way to go. And then from there, again, uh, and I'm going to use this now too, the, the magic's in the movement. Um, once it started, it's like, man, there's, there's an entire mission that, that, that turns into a movement around Hero. And um, so I started to pivot it. And we built a beverage brand called Hero Beverage and bought drinkhero.com and started, um, started with coffee 
to do hero coffees. And I, I ran it into five silos. So we do police, fire, military, medical, and education. And the concept was uh, very much a you buy, we give conversation. You buy for police, we'll donate and help back to, to cops, firefighters, teachers, et cetera. And then um, in short order, it, it, in a matter of months, we, we built the site, got the trademarks, got all the IP stuff around it, uh, started the coffee up and got it going. And it's it's like, I, again, the dam just sort of broke and it's turning into a movement. Yeah. And we put a survey out. I mean, I have people, what I found was if you're helping someone in any way, shape or form, everybody wants to be recognized in some capacity as a hero. And we're, I mean, we're happy to do it. So we've had everybody uh, from farmers to scientists to uh, chemical engineers to truck drivers to uh, corrections officers, dispatchers, all message into us asking, when's that coming out? And so we actually are rolling out um, uh, a farmer blend. We've got EMS coming out, the dispatcher blend coming out, uh, the truck driver one coming out. Um, and then uh, we've got two special ones that I'm, I'm really excited about that are sort of collaborations and partnerships with us. And one is the Ted and Chris Kyle Foundation. Uh -huh. And then the other one's Firefighter Cancer Support Network. And so what we're doing is I've onboarded them in. And uh, Chris is actually on the bag now for the legend blend. Um, and I had Taya, you know, send her a bunch of stuff. She tested it. She tasted it. You know, let, it's all her world on as far as what we're doing. And so she got to select whatever coffee she wanted to put in the bag. We built the legend because if you know anything about Chris, I mean, that was his, his handle or moniker was the legend. And um, so he, he's coming out now. And so Taya gets to push that out and get proceeds back to help her and their foundation support military and first responder families. Uh, Firefighter Cancer Support Network touches firehouses across the United States, Canada, and Germany. And they, they actually have uh, programs that help firefighters and their families because a lot of these guys and gals out there dealing with all the smoke and inhalation, mm -hmm. they get, you know, cancer that develops. And so we've, uh, we've onboarded them and are getting ready to take the lid off of that one in the next week or so um, that gives back to help with cancer research and, and education for all the firefighters around the world that want to support that firefighter cancer support network. That's awesome. And that's the beauty of building relationships and friendships and networks because that's how you and I are talking or through my good friend, Taya. And 100%. I think, um, you know, when good people see other people, good people doing good things, you just want to jump in and, and connect and unite. And that's definitely uh, one way I would describe her. So I'm so grateful. Yeah. I'll call yeah. her up and thank her for, for hooking us up and we'll put, uh, you know, we'll push her bag for all of your, her, your, your products really, but we'll give Taya's a little extra edge uh, on yeah, our please site do. And, and push please it do. out uh, for it's, her and for Chris and, and all she does. Yeah. If you haven't seen it yet, you can get on to drink hero and pull yeah, up the I legend have. product page. Yep. There's a great video. She and I sat down for about 15 minutes and just talked about why it was meaningful for her and Chris and heroes yeah. and helping and public service and, and, you know, services is a calling. I mean, it's just helping everybody's a big deal. Plus coffee's awesome. She knows Who when we were in the city, <laughs> when we were in the city with her a year and a half ago, before all this like hell broke loose. Uh, yeah. She laughed at me a little bit for, uh, for calling up the hotel room and everything I went through to get a coffee pot in our room, but I got her one too. So, Good. you know, <laughs> Good. All right. Look, I'd love to keep chatting with you all day, but we are pretty much out of time here. I would like to make sure everybody knows where to find you, find your brands, find out more information on you one more time. So let's put it in one nice, neat little package. Where can they go to find out more about your products? So leatherbackgear.com, just like it sounds, leatherbackgear, G-E-A-R.com, all one word. And you can find out all about our personal protection systems. Uh, drinkhero.com is all around the apparel and give back and helping everybody remain operational. Um, Leatherback, I don't have anything about me personally in there um, because I was in the service for so long, but I think we're going to change yeah. a little bit. But you can read a little bit about me and my team on, uh, on Drink Hero's website under the About Us. Yeah, awesome. What, what question I had too about the armor place, what, what about going through TSA? Are there issues with that? None whatsoever. None? In fact, okay. ironically, you could find it right on TSA's website. There's two okay, ways you cool. can transport armor. Uh, on an airplane. Number one, okay. you put it in your checked luggage like a suitcase. Mm -hmm. So if I was to take a bulletproof vest like I used to do all the time, I'd just put it in a suitcase. The other way you do it is in a carry-on, which a backpack is a carry-on. Yeah. Awesome. I was curious about that because no one, no one likes getting stuck at TSA and you definitely don't want to have to like throw that out or go back and check it. And No. Uh, in yeah. fact, Barbara, we've had, um, <laughs> yeah. we've had people 
respond yeah. with um, uh, comments and emails saying that they've traveled to Tokyo, no issue, Bogota, Perfect. London, Perfect. Toronto, New York, uh, it, no issue whatsoever. Awesome. All right. And then I have one more question I have to ask you or my boss, Dave Brown, will fire me. Um, we we started American Snippets a few years ago when we first noticed the divisiveness starting to hit with no clue that it was only going to get worse, right? But uh, part of what impacted us and me in particular as a Gold Star wife whose husband died in service to our country, it was impacting me directly to hear people just talking about how much they hated our country and didn't value it mm -hmm. and didn't care about it. And it was really having an, like, a mental and emotional impact on me. But I knew that there are a lot of amazing people in this country. And I was convinced that if we could just bring those people to other people, that would help change hearts and minds and at least give it a little perspective. And one of those things that uh, came under attack and continues to be under attack is the concept of the American dream. A lot of people believe it is dead, will never come back, or that it never existed, or that's only available for certain people. We call false on all those. We believe the opposite. We just, we make the distinction that the American dream is unique and different and tailored specifically to each individual. And we all have our own version of that American dream. So to that note, we'd like to ask you, what is your own version of that American dream? Well, that's a tough one, man, because again, the magic's in the movement, right? I, I've been yeah. living the American dream coming from the middle of Ridgecrest, California uh, to, to walk the halls of the White House and be on the president's detail. I mean, that, that could have been the pinnacle for me, but um, pivoting from that and jumping into what I do now, for me, um, I, I think the American dream and the entrepreneurial spirit is what drives the train forward. Um, and, and it's the constant movement of that going is what's only going to keep that spark happening and, and igniting. Um, and, and the dream for me is building the brands that we do. And I'm not done. I've got more brands that we want to start, more businesses we want to start. But the big one that I'm so passionate about in, is Hero, I think, has is, is got tremendous power to help not just somebody with a, their life on a backpack, which is, again, I could stop there and be done and just focus on leatherback. But Hero is going to affect so many different categories to help and give back. And helping everybody remain operational as a story, um, I think sparks interest across the board, no matter who you are. Yeah, we love it. Obviously, it is something. It's an excellent example of how we all have the ability to take that one thing we're good at and make a ripple effect that's going to impact others. And if one person does it, another person does it, another person like that's the movement that we need to catch on and stop focusing on well, all these other things waves. and. Yeah. So if we can just, that's why I love bringing people like you and your stories out there, maybe to inspire somebody to start yeah. their, whatever it is, maybe they sell lemonades or pencils or what, who knows? Well, join like, the secret service. What? I mean, they, they need the, the best service. of the best, you know? Yeah. But, there's but, so many things you could do. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think, um, those ripple effects become movement. They become waves that change and, and cause yep. movements, but it's never just like my story is I'm giving you glossy stuff because of the time frame that we're under. But it's not all sunshine and, you know, gumdrops and lollipops either. It's not like I just decided and it's like, oh, my God, yeah, hey, psh, off we go. It's constant, constant grind, constant over challenges, you know, overcoming challenges. I've had everything from investor issues with a guy that we, we dealt with that, you know, that'll be the end of that conversation on air. But um, to problems trying to find a market for people to buy what we were doing leatherback to people mm -hmm. telling me I'm insane and crazy to raising capital to push Hero to the bounds that it needs to go. So it, it's not easy and it's not for everybody. Just like being a Secret Service agent and standing there taking it isn't for everybody. But the American right. spirit and, and ingenuity and the sparks that drive it are absolutely alive and well. And I don't, I, somebody that wants to squash that and kill it is the, is the surest way to cause it to grow exponentially. Love it. Man, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us today. Thank you for everything we do. We're going to put your information up on our site uh, along with this, this story and periodically we'll pop it on up and remind people where you are, what you're doing, and hopefully we can help you know, support your community and people will enjoy your products as well. well I appreciate it. Thanks for having me and anything I can do to help thank you as well. You.